In this video, I'm going to talk about Bloch's theorem. And so Griffiths actually doesn't talk about this until the beginning of the next chapter, but uh, he actually uses Bloch's theorem in what I'm going to be, be doing in the next video, which is looking at a repeating delta function potential. But then he doesn't sort of prove Bloch's theorem until the beginning of the next chapter. And so I'm actually doing this one first before I do the next one. And I'm going to be going to, into a bit more detail on this than what Griffiths does, because I, I think it'll help to understand the concepts a little bit better. All right, and so we can start by first defining a translation vector. And so a translation is just a movement in space, and so a movement in some direction in space. And so this translation vector moves our wave function to another location in space, a distance of A from where it was. Uh, and for simplicity, I'm using just one dimension of space. I'm actually going to talk about three dimensions, how this can apply to two and three dimensions uh, later on in this video. But for now, we'll just think about it in terms of one dimension. And so we apply our, our translation operator to our wave function, and it gives us this wave function that's uh, some distance away. And so if we wanted to recenter it on x, we would just do this. And so this uh, this psi star would actually be x plus a. Uh, and so if we wanted to just recenter that on on x, then we would do psi x plus a minus a, which a minus a just gives us x again. And so uh, that's why we are doing it that way. And so this translation operator is related to the quantum momentum operator, this p with a hat on it by using its Taylor series. And so we expand this into a Taylor series. Uh, we do a little bit of uh, rearranging here. And so we end up with this. But this part here, the summation of 1 over n factorial times this is just the exponential function. And so we end up getting this right here. And so this, uh, this exponential right here uh, as we'll see, is actually sort of like the eigenvalue for this operator. And so we know that our operator is a unitary vector, so its magnitude has to be 1. And so the magnitude uh, we're talking about, because this is complex, can extend into the complex plane. And so uh, obviously this isn't going to be equal to 1 every time, but its magnitude will be equal to 1. It's just that it'll have a direction in complex space. Uh, and so that's true of every exponential like this, which is why that sort of famous uh, Euler identity of e to the i pi uh, minus 1 equals 0, because e to the i pi is just uh, is just one and so you know the magnitude is always one so this means that uh, if we do this inverse so we use this minus a here which then you know a minus minus just gives us a plus and so the inverse of our operator is just equal to the operator of the sort of inverse distance which is also going to be equal to our uh, adjoint here. And so this first equality here means that the inverse of shifting something a to the right is just sh shifting something a to the left, which uh, I think is pretty self-explanatory. If you shift something to the right one foot, then the inverse of that is just shifting something to the left by one foot. Uh, and so uh, we have this, like I said, so we just have this double minus here, which makes it a plus. And so our our inverse is also equal to our adjoint, because the adjoint is just the complex conjugate, which just uh, changes the sign of our complex number. And so our t, or our e to the minus i a over h bar p is just going to be uh, a positive i a over h bar p. Uh, and so we can also look at this. So if we have some operator x hat, uh, and we uh, and we want to surround it by the the uh, 
the translation operator and this adjoint like this, which gives us this uh, shifted operator here. Uh, if we uh, we show that uh, the translation operator, sorry, bit of a brain fart, acting on our test function here just gives us the function of x minus a. And so when we uh, then act the, the uh, x on that, it just multiplies it by x. So the, this x operator just multiplies it by x. And so then when we act with our inverse translation operator, we just get this x plus a here. And so we have this uh, x prime operator acting on our function just gives us x plus a times our function here. And so this uh, x prime operator is just equal to x hat plus a, which means that we just move the entire coordinate system to the left by a so that the position coordinates are now greater by a. Uh, so a system is translationally invariant if the Hamiltonian commutes with the translation operator. So we have this uh, this primed Hamiltonian operator here being equal to this, which we have equal to our Hamiltonian operator. So we multiply both sides by this translation operator, which uh, the, what we have in red here is just equal to 1. So we have uh, the h hat uh, acting or times our uh, our translation operator equal to our translation operator times our Hamiltonian here and so we just subtract both sides we get zero and so we have this and this follows from uh, actually doing this uh, doing this this commutation with uh, how we define our Hamiltonian here times how we define our translation operator minus how we define our translation operator times how we define our Hamiltonian. And so we just go through the math with that. Uh, so we end up with this red part here, which is just, just equal to, so this uh, exponential here times this V v of x, which is our potential, just gives us the potential uh, some distance a, you know, in, in so we're using one direction here, so uh, we're using one dimension, so it's just a in the positive direction. Uh, and then we just take this minus this, so we cancel that part, and so we end up with this, uh, so I'm just moving this uh, exponential over to the left of this, uh, which then just makes it x plus a, minus, you know, the V of X plus A, which is equal to zero, which tells us that these things do, in fact, commute. And so the translational symmetry then says that uh, our V of X uh, equals the V of X plus A. So the potential is repeating. And so that will actually come in handy in the next video when I talk about a repeating potential that is modeled as a delta function. Uh, and so that is, this is why that actually works. Uh, it's because the Hamiltonian and the translation operator uh, commute with each other. Uh, and so this can mean one of two things, either the potential is constant everywhere. So, you know, we could move by just some infinitesimal amount to in one direction and it works, or it means the potential is repeating, which means that this a has to be multiplied by some integer. Uh, and it's the second one we're interested in for Bloch's theorem. Uh, and that's because we were interested in a repeating potential, uh, as we'll see in the next video. So if two operators commute, they have simultaneous set of eigenstates. Uh, this means that the Hamiltonian or translation operator have simultaneous eigenstates. So we act our Hamiltonian operator on our wave function that gives us our, our energy eigenstate here times our wave function. And similarly, if we act with the translation operator on our wave function, that gives us some, uh, some lambda, some eigenvalue times our wave function. Uh, and that means that whenever we apply the uh, the translation operator any number of times, so n a, where a is our unit length and n is our integer, uh, such that we have this. So we're acting this 
uh, on here, I guess, n times. Uh, that gives us x plus uh, our a n times. So the Hamiltonian uh, h hat will remain the same. So the upshot of this is that the wave function repeats over every unit length a. And so we only need to know the what the h hat, what the Hamiltonian is for a single unit length because then we're just repeating that for every other unit uh, down the line. Uh, and so each one of those, uh, as we'll see, is actually multiplied by this eigenvalue with uh, this n up here in the exponent there. And so that n is just the same n that we have here. And so the unitarity of our translation operator means that lambda has to have a magnitude of 1. Uh, this is satisfied by having our lambda equal to e to the i uh, times some real number here. And so we, by convention, we set this uh, phi here equal to minus qa, where h bar q is uh, the so-called crystal momentum. And so momentum, uh, and we'll actually find this uh, in a later video, and this is kind of why uh, Griffiths has this in a different chapter, because it's in the chapter that's talking about uh, how these uh, symmetries imply or are associated with conservation laws. And so, uh, so translational symmetry is associated with conservation of momentum. And so in a crystal, so, you know, nothing is actually uh, moving, you know, a crystal lattice is this sort of static thing, but there's this thing called the crystal momentum. And that's because a crystal is something that has translational symmetry. Uh, and so there's this crystal momentum. Uh, and so that's why we use Q, even though, as we'll see, Q is related to, uh, to K, which uh, as I talked about in the last video, is related to the energy of something. And so uh, we use Q because Q takes crystal momentum uh, plus uh, sort of the uh, sort of traditional momentum that we all know and love into account. Uh, so Q is related to K, but it also takes this crystal momentum into account. And so we can't just call it K. Uh, but anyway, so this means that in general, uh, like I said, when we act n times on our wave function with our translation uh, operator, we end up with this exponential here with n in the exponential times our, our wave function here. Uh, or we can say that uh, our wave function uh, with this minus n a is equal to this as well. And so this is just the same as uh, as our wave function here uh, re-centered with the minus n a. But we can also define this. And so what we see here, we have this u of x, which is a periodic function. And now this, this exponential here is actually a function of x as well. Uh, so this u of x is a periodic function such that, uh, you know, the, the u of x is the same uh, every time we translate by some uh, amount a, by some integer amount a. Uh, and this e to the i q x is a traveling wave, so that actually describes a free particle. Uh, and this works because if we have our psi x minus n a here, uh, which is just equal to this e to the i q, and then we have x minus n a, and then our u of x plus n a, and we go through, and what we end up with is this this uh, e to the i or minus i q n a times this in red, which this in red we just defined as our wave function here, and so if we just uh, substitute this psi of x here in for what's in red up here, we just end up with this. Uh, and so we just get back to what we had. And so this, uh, this actually works as well. And so I have here uh, in, this, in this Desmos graphing calculator, so I wanted to show what, what these things actually mean. So when we have this 
this exponential here, which is a function of Q. Uh, so what we end up having is this. And so when we change Q, we see that this that the amplitude of this actually goes up and down. And so what we see is there are some cues where the wave function is actually uh, zero like this. And this will be important, as we'll see in the next video, is that there are disallowed cues, which remember I said Q is related to K, which is related to energy. And so we'll actually see that that ends up meaning that there are disallowed energies. So we this is repeating so if we keep adjusting this up and down we see that this repeats where there are repeating disallowed energies here and that actually ends up uh, bringing our band structure that we'll see in uh, the next couple videos in. And so this Q, this uh, exponential here, times our wave function is telling us that, uh, you know, sometimes this Q, when it's multiplied by a certain N, will actually go to zero. And so we actually just cancel out this, uh, this wave function at different at different cues and so that is actually where we end up with our forbidden energies uh, which is what generates our band structure and so we can actually look at uh, we can look at our function here so this one is actually if we're looking at this where it's the the function of X where our exponential is a function of X and so we can actually uh, we can actually change the Q on that, and you can see that this actually generates these uh, sort of wave packets like this. Uh, and so this is actually generating the wave packets where, uh, as we'll see in the next video, between these wave packets here are, are what will be the potentials. And so uh, the potentials are where, you know, the are sort of repelling the electrons or actually in a crystal lattice the potentials are uh, sort of negative potentials where the nucleus is where it has that positive charge and so there's actually sort of a negative potential where the electron wants to be uh, and so uh, I will so I do have this linked and this this whole thing will be in the linked to in the description down below so that the entire lecture notes here will be linked to in the description down below and so you can actually click on that link and you can play around with some of these things so this p1 here is sort of the uh the the version where we have this uh well the, I have this E1 here, which is supposed to be kind of like our our E to the I X, uh, and so that's uh, that's sort of the the real part of this. So if you remember the the Euler identity of E to the I X is equal to cosine uh, of X uh, plus I sine of X, and so this is just the the cosine part of that, uh, and I square it so that uh, it just it makes it all positive and so uh, it's sort of the the born rule and it just tells us the actual probability uh, of where you want to f or where you will find the particle uh, and so then this one uh, is the function of Q and so we uh, we can adjust the Q and so you can see where the the band structures are so you get down to here and these are sort of the lowest energy they have the highest wavelength and so uh, you keep increasing the wavelength but you reduce the amplitude until you get down to this point where it's zero uh, and so that is sort of a forbidden energy uh, and then you kind of keep going like this and you see the wavelength keeps getting smaller and smaller but you're oscillating between these uh, these forbidden energies uh, but anyway I don't want to uh, harp on that too long so that is sort of looking at uh, Bloch's theorem uh, in one dimension so the the general takeaway for that is that uh, when we translate uh, so we can translate by these integer amounts times our sort of unit length uh, and that gives us this eigenvalue here and so it's just our wave our 
wave function here times this sort of phase factor here. And so it's just telling us that each sort of unit cell, and so we'll see in the next video that a unit cell is an area between two delta function potentials. Uh, the wave function will actually be the same in each one of those cells. Uh, and so we can look at how that actually then applies in three dimensions here. And so we have our, our same translation operator here, but now instead of just adding an N1, uh, A1, which is in one dimension, so we, you know, start like right here, and then we add, you know, N, A, where this is our sort of uh, a right here and so it just moves us over to right there but now we want to do that in three dimensions and so we have to you know move in the x direction then sort of in the y direction and then also in the z direction and so for that uh, what we want to do is define a sort of primitive cell uh, which is what uh, what I'm talking about here. And so a primitive cell is something that has the A1 uh, in the X direction. It's, it's a length of A1 in the X direction, a length of A2 in the Y direction, and a length of A3 in the Z direction. Uh, and so that actually defines a parallelopiped, uh, which looks like this. And sort of the the simplest parallel pipette is one where the angles are all 90 degrees and so it's just uh, you know a a cube but if we have these different angles on it then you can sort of skew this cube in different directions uh, and that gives you what is called more generally a parallel pipette uh, whose uh, volume the volume of this is just going to be this triple product which is uh, you take the cross product of a2 and a3 which uh, on here uh, it has uh, a b and c but we can sort of define b as our a2 and c as our a Three. And so you take the cross product of that, and that will give you some uh, vector pointing in the uh, orthogonal direction. So it'll be some vector sort of pointing up this way. And then you take the dot product of that with our A, which we can see is our A1 here. Uh, and that actually gives you the volume because this vector, that's the cross product of A2 and A3, uh, is... Uh, well, it's a vector that tells you what the area of this this uh, shaded region down here is. And so when you take the dot product of A1 with that, then it gives you the volume of your parallelopiped. Uh, and so that is uh, sort of how we think about our, our primitive cell, which uh, the primitive cell is similar to what we talked about in the one dimension where we had this and we defined some length a here and so it was just sort of a repeating uh, a repeating a so we had 1a then 2a then we had 3a and so now we are just repeating this parallel pipe head in three dimensions and so uh, you know we'll just take this whole thing translate it over uh, here and there will be another parallel pipette where it will share a face here uh, There will be another one on top of it There will be another one behind and in front and on this side and so a crystal lattice is just a repeating pattern of these parallel pipettes put one after the other uh, Where you know, like I said in the simplest version a cube you can think about it as just a sort of 3D grid. Uh, so that is our primitive cell. Uh, so the lattice in real space also has a reciprocal space, which as I talked about in the last video was the K space. Uh, and it has its own sort of translation operator, which is this G here, uh, such that if we take the dot product of T and G, it equals uh, sort of uh, integer multiples of this 2 pi here. Uh, and so you will recognize from that that uh, that T is sort of like the dual space er, of G, which 
uh, I guess it's technically true, but G is the dual space of T uh, is probably the way that we would state that. So G is sort of the dual space of T. And so we take the components and do the multiplication like this, and we get 2 pi times the Kronecker delta, meaning that E to the dot product of both of these is equal to 1. And sort of get a little bit more intuition of what G is. So we have our G's here. Uh, and so if you remember from uh, uh, an earlier video that I talked about, uh, and I talked about this in my video series on tensors. So the dual space is kind of like these plane waves that uh, share sort of uh, a, a row or, you know, a, a sort of uh, column or row of one of these uh, actual vectors here where the, the actual vectors are given by this basis here where uh, we start at this one and then uh, going up, we use this green sort of basis vector here, and going to the side, we use this blue basis vector here. And so we can see that these G's different, uh, these G's here can be uh, different sort of plane waves uh, defined in our space here. Uh, so the K space of the primitive cell, so that parallelepiped is what's known as the uh, Brewan cell. Uh, and so, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. It's French, and I'm terrible at pronouncing, uh, well, a lot of things, but French in particular. But uh, I believe it's pronounced something similar to Brewan. But anyway... Uh, so this cell is important because the wave of vectors within it uh, acts as a sort of basis for all the other wave vectors uh, because all the other wave vectors will just be uh, sort of uh, scalar multiples of these vectors in the Brewan cell, uh, meaning that we only have to know the information about the Brewan cell in order to know the information about all these cells. And so we can look at these uh, Brewan cells a little bit in a little bit more detail here. So we have, so this is direct lattice. This would be like the real space lattice. So we have these sort of evenly, uh, evenly distributed or regularly uh, repeating uh, dots here. Where, uh, and obviously this is in 2D, but uh, we can define a a cell. Uh, or a, a primitive cell as being something like this. Uh, and so I can maybe draw that a little bit straighter. Uh, and so we have a primitive cell that looks like this, where, you know, a translation over to this side, it just gives us this cell. And so it's just repeating two-dimensional cells. Uh, and so that is our primitive cell. Uh, and then so we can define the Brewan cell. So we just take this uh, this A star, which we can think of as sort of our uh, what I was talking about with B1 up here. Uh, but I'll talk about it in terms of the A star and B star. So this A star is, uh, is uh, perpendicular to this B here. And then this B star here is perpendicular to this A, and that defines our uh, reciprocal lattice here. And so uh, that's how we define the reciprocal lattice. And remember that if we took the uh, took the uh, the A uh, dot with our A star here, it would just give us one. Uh, and then the B dot with the B star here would just give us one. And so we can. Uh, we can do what's called a Voronoi decomposition, which is essentially just uh, we take our reciprocal lattice here and we draw boxes around it such that everything inside the box is closer to this dot than it is to any other dot. Uh, and so the, uh, the I guess the the air, the uh, spots on the line would be equidistant from that dot and that dot. And so that is what a, Veron a Veronoi decomposition is. And so this, uh, and I kind of don't like how this shows it here, but it shows the B star uh, as being sort of the 
uh, height of this box, but it would also be the distance from this dot inside the box here to this dot up here. Uh, and same with this A star, it's the uh, width of this box here, but it would also be the distance from this uh, dot in here to this dot over there. And that's why this K is just equal to the A star, because it's A star away from this dot inside here, which we're using as our origin. And so you see that this dot is just sort of, uh, you know, a, a scalar multiple of this A star, uh, which uh, we can see is defined everywhere inside this this sort of, uh, well, the Bri-1 uh, zone here. And so this one up here is just applying the A star to get to here and then applying the B star, which brings us up to here. And so we can see how we can build the entire uh, K space lattice uh, by just things inside this first zone here, this Bri-1 zone. Uh, and the other thing to notice too is that we have uh, these, these aren't perfect rectangles. We have these sort of flattened corners here because that is equidistant from, uh, from these two dots here. And so that is what the uh, Voronoi decomposition is, is defining our lattice as being equidistant to uh, each of these uh, dots inside of our uh, K-space lattice. Uh, and so this is just looking at the, uh, the real space lattice and the uh, reciprocal lattice for a, a cube. So, you know, this is, uh, well, a square in two dimensions is a square. Uh, and then we, this is our bri one zone. Uh, so this is just looking at it for something that's hexagonal. Uh, so we have uh, this A1 and A2 here. So these hex hexagons are just a shift uh, from this one to this one, which then can be shifted down to here. Uh, and so you can build the entire hexagonal lattice based on that. Uh, so uh, I've also seen it defined where you would have, uh, you would have it the, uh, instead of these uh, being 120 degrees from each other, or 60 degrees from each other, you'd have a 120 degrees. So you'd have the A1 there. Uh, and so that actually gets uh, to uh, our definition where this B1 here is is actually uh, uh, orthogonal or perpendicular to our A2, and this B2 is perpendicular to our A1. But this is our K space right here. Uh, but anyway, if we if we wanted to look at sort of this 2D version of the K-space in three dimensions, it would look something like this, uh, where you see this is uh, this is this uh, this uh, this shape here that has sort of these corners shaved off because we are now starting at this point here and we're looking at everything equidistant from that point, and so. Uh, this point and then, you know, some other point in a, a uh, repeat of this shape above it, uh, this surface right here would be equidistant from that point above it and this point down here below it. And so we can see how this K space is actually repeated here uh, in, uh, in three dimensions as well. And what you'll notice too is that this shape here is different from what we found in the previous video where we did not have were, have the sort of repeating cells. Uh, we actually had just a continuous because we said there that there was no uh, repeating potentials and it. it was just a continuous and we ended up getting a sphere in our K space for that. And so you can see how adding those repeating potentials gives a different shape from our sphere. Uh, and so we can see how that's going to change sort of the allowed energy levels and uh, I guess sort of the disallowed energy levels where, uh, you know, if there, if there was a sphere here, we could see that there are, uh, that there are disallowed energy levels where this has been flattened uh, here uh, where the, the disallowed energy levels are, but uh, that's getting 
a little bit ahead of ourselves. Uh, and so this is just looking at, uh, we can look at Bloch's theorem in three dimensions. So we're just acting our three dimensional version of the translation vector, which now this R where the R is sort of the real space in terms of X, Y, Z is just instead of adding uh, this single term onto it, we're now adding three terms onto it. And so that's just sort of the main difference uh, between doing this in one dimension and doing it in three dimensions. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of the take home message for all this is that Bloch's theorem is just telling us uh, that uh, when we have these repeating cells, whether it's in one dimension, uh, two dimensions or the sort of parallel pipeheads in three dimensions uh, that uh, the the wave function in uh, in one cell is going to be translated to all the other cells and so if we know the wave function in a single cell uh, we know the wave function in all of the other cells uh, and therefore we also know if we know the energy levels in one K space cell, we know the energy levels in all the other K space cells because the energy levels are uh, defined by the Hamiltonian, which uh, is translationally symmetric and therefore the Hamiltonian is the same in every cell. Uh, and so that is sort of the take home message uh, for Bloch's theorem is that uh, you know, with, with a repeating potential, which is, you know, how you would model a crystal where you have repeating, uh, repeating nuclei uh, for our atoms in the crystal lattice act as these repeating potentials. And so Bloch's theorem can apply to this. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to ramble on for too long. Uh, once again, the show notes uh, will be linked to in the description if you wanted to look at those in a little bit more detail. Uh, but anyway, uh, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.